British Orthopaedic Association meeting, felt that the things that were improving and expanding in orthopaedic surgery were so exciting and so bizarre and so, and, uh, they were talking about joint replacement and things like that. How could you ever think, and they, well, fun was made make of, of the people who were bringing this out. The key was one of the earliest one. Uh, he had this metal on metal joint in the hip joint and he gave this presentation and the president said, Mr. McKee, you've forgotten to tell us where you put the grease nipple. <laughs> he, poor McKee was well, confounded, didn't know what he was talking about. But we were up at, a, that was a time when expanding orthopedics was so rapid and so bizarre in the eyes of many people as to worry considerably about where it was all heading and whether it was all going to go to disaster. And 49 surgeons from that meeting had a little side meeting of their own in which they said, what about the rest of the world who will never be engaged in this sort of bizarre research? How are they going, are we paying any attention at all to the orthopedics that they are perforce having to do? And of course the answer was no. And it's even more so now, there's, a, uh, there's an aspect which uh, I've given as, as a subtitle was Bridging the Gap. And this is a one, this is a, a title, a phrase that is becoming increasingly well used. It, it acknowledge, acknowledges the fact that there is an increasing gap between those who are entrepreneurs, inventors, uh, men of vision and so forth, and those who have not even made the first step on the ladder towards orthopedic surgery from uh, medical school. The analogy of a ladder is appropriate. The great in inventors are at the top of this ladder. They've been up and, they're, and, they're, and they're, that ladder is branching. So that now orthopedic surgery is, cannot be considered to be a general branch of surgery, but divided into uh, subspecialities. When I was appointed to consultant surgeon, there were um, three orthopedic surgeons at, at Guy's Hospital in London. When I left, 26 years later, there were 33. Now, they weren't all orthopedic surgeons. None of them was an orthopedic surgeon in general, because perforce they had to subspecialize. Now, the disease, as I almost might call it, of specialization has been very damaging to the third world because now nobody has a training uh, plan towards general orthopedics. It is thought in Western affluent countries such as this uh, to be old fashioned and retrograde and um, you, you, you can't uh, operate on the, on the hip joint and the toe and the finger. It's impossible to know all that's known about each of those. So in other words, orthopedics for the third world, or should we say the under-resourced parts of the third world, is becoming uh, increasingly remote. And it is damaging because uh, nowhere can it be taught. Young surgeons in those uh, under-resourced countries see the centers of excellence in the West as being the places where modern orthopedics is growing and expanding and wonderfully exciting the things are done. Uh, and of course, well rewarded too. Whereas if you're in a remote parts of Uganda, for example, uh, the prospect of, of playing with these rather attractive toys is very, very remote. Now we've heard this morning that uh, there's a desperate shortage of surgery being done and, they, and there's a scheme of a World Health Organization to get more surgery done. I, have, I hesitated to follow that because I spend much of my time stopping surgery being done by those who actually haven't got the resources or the training or the knowledge or experience to do it. That it was always dangerous that you would be accused of talking down to people. That is unattractive. But to go to these countries where it is desperately in need and take part in the surgery that they do, that will carry weight because you see and they see you working and how you work and the reasons why you work. That's an aspect which I find is a huge gap in medical education, or should I say surgical training, of all sorts. Which points I've lost the way in which I was, my next thought was on the subject. Um, I went to one, one of the, the two countries that I have experience of, are Nepal and um, Ethiopia. Neither of which, I have to confess, and this limitation of, of the validity of what I say, neither did I work there for any length of time, but I used to visit it for about three weeks at a time, twice a year, enough to be a small help. 
but you really need to go and work for rather longer than that to leave a permanent impression. Many of us were trained as apprentices to great uh, surgeons of renown and to teaching authority. It doesn't happen in our country or Western Europe now any longer. The apprenticeship is gone, which is a pity. But it's what exactly what is required in places where resources are extremely remote, presumably poor, and the places are remote. When I went to, first went to uh, Ethiopia, it was 2003, um, I, was take, I went to join somebody else who had who'd started a department of orthopedics in, at the teaching hospital in, in Ethiopia, and it was well established. And he was getting a bit tired, and as we all do from time to time, he, he was also getting a little bit depressed because when he went to uh, the hospital, the idea of taking part in the training, which was well established, and he did it extremely well, he noticed that all the surgeons, or many of the surgeons there, left the hospital and went back to their private practices, so he, and leaving him to teach the undergraduates. Now, at first, he, he was, he was uh, a little bit peeved by this. He thought he was going to talk to them and with them to the undergraduates. But they go off when they see the opportunity. The load, the clinical load in places where the facilities are few is huge. And the good surgeons are in even greater demand than anybody else. And private practice is a huge lure. Now, we felt that we, that was actually the opposite of our object, but, uh, of our intention. But we got to learn that that was not wrong. <coughs> the reputation of training of surgeons in under-resourced parts, should we say Saharan, Saharan Africa in general, that which means the whole of the world, at that level of resource. The whole of the, the, uh, those, 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 they see a medical qualification and a surgical qualification as a visa or a passport to the West. Now, it's difficult, you have the same problems as we do in England, of, of immigration. The bright and best from Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa want to come to places where they can exercise their brilliance, exercise that which they have been trained to do. And although we try to, re to stop that, I have a sympathy for them. Many of them are invited or apply and are accepted to go to training jobs in England uh, in, in, the, in the speciality, a speciality within surgery. If they stay for six months, then they'll be unemployable in their own country. No good saying, no, you can't stay. We're going to give you six months visa. You've got to go back then. We have done them a damage if we leave them with, a, with an expertise. I, I can remember several people who've come to this country, worked at centres of excellence in London, and been engaged largely in doing revision arthroplasty of the knee. Most of the surgeon's time is now undoing the erroneous replacements of the past. That's no use for someone who's working in the rural Ethiopia. None at all. It's inappropriate. And with this experience, it took a long time for us to learn this, we realized that the training of surgeons to treat the rural population of any of these countries must be done in those countries, on the facilities, on the surgeons, with the pathology which obtains there. There's a very great inequality of required orthopedic surgery in the world. Now, it's perhaps wrong to think about this as a national difficulty from one country to another. No signal, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the greatest countries in the world is India, in my estimation. It has, in the big cities, some of the best, finest hospitals and the best sort surgeons in the world. But it also has large areas of absolute aberrant poverty. So national barriers do not divide these things. These are social, almost social, and certainly economic divisions which every country in the world has. The centers of excellence in India have done wonderful work, have created a huge reputation, and people go to India to be treated by those people who are best, if those best surgeons haven't already gone to centers of excellence in the, in the West. Recently, one of the principal one a great friend of mine and one of the best surgeons in, in India, an orthopedic surgeon generally, is a man called Rajasekharan. Does it ring a bell for anybody? Probably not. Oh, you do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a, a absolutely brilliant orthopedic surgeon. Very specialized, very specialist. Does navigational replacements of things. And I, I went to see him and he was biopsying 
the odontoid peg that I thought was a very deep operation, going to take hours. No, it only took 20 minutes with a needle directed straight through the mouth and so on. A brilliant surgeon. But his feet are very, very firmly on the ground. He was president of the Indian Orthopedic Association and almost everything else, if he had a chance to be ambitious, but a brilliant surgeon. And he was appalled by the fact that the carnage on the roads of India is like a battleground and a shame and a disgrace to the country. Now, we have heard this morning uh, several expressions of how, you know, this is a terrible thing that's very difficult to deal with such an enormous problem. And the ministers of health will hold up their hands. Well, they're in arguments with the defense ministry and the ministry of other things with the pressures for on their, on their, um, their available uh, money. So he took the government to the court and sued the government for neglect of their responsibility to the populace of Delhi in particular, that's what he was talking about. And to everybody's astonishment, he won. So the, these, these eminent senior judges turned on me, on the government, to say that you are obliged in your constitution, details of which I don't have, uh, uh, that was in their constitution to look after the people, and they were not being looked after, this decimation of thousands of people being killed and maimed on the roads of Delhi, and the appalling uh, traffic conditions uh, were a source of, uh, of shame and often humor. Unfortunately, they had a, I thought, oh, yeah, this is going to run into the ground, because they had a general election a couple of weeks later, months later. Um, but no, the, a new government came in, and they appointed a surgeon to be Minister of Health. So the, these are, I'm just saying these things are not the things that would, would uh, can be followed in our case, but the, the fact is that we are simply pawns in a, in a pr production of service to the people of, of the country in which we're talking about. I'd like to get rid of the national borders. These are international problems, and every country has got it. Now, this, when I first went to Ethiopia, uh, there was a boom, an economic boom in the country. There's a lot of East African countries um, that is the case. Huge economic boom. Chinese were, th were pouring money into the country because they built roads, and they were built roads out in areas where they had no roads, and when they got to the end of the road, they dug. And if they dug, they discovered. And all sorts of rare earths and gas and things that are in high-class industry in China is desperate for. And seeing this happen, the, the Americans poured money in as well. So they had a, a boom town. So they, find, they, said, they said the Ministry uh, uh, of Education put out a thing that we're going to expand university training for, for, um, for Ethiopians. We must have more doctors. That's absolutely true. The desperate shortage of doctors and over 50% of the women emigrating as soon as they were qualifying. This was desperately bad. That's a, a disattraction, really, to giving scholarships to people in, in uh, under-resourced countries to come and be trained <coughs> in their area interests, but not in their nation's interests, not in the country's interests. Mm. But they, uh, the, the, so that, was, that was the situation. They had to pr produce oh, something like, a, they had to multiply the medical profession, not by 100%, by 400%. And they said, of course, it takes five years to produce one doctor. OK. Mm -hmm. they, uh, and if, you, if we went as, as a training surgeon to Addis, as we did, um, and we found that the doctors, specialist doctors, were going off into private practice, then they, then in a way, their training of these young men was up to us. And we were specialists ourselves, so we had to untrain much of our things to re revert into what we had been trained to do as young men. I found this extremely uh, rejuvenating to suddenly resurrect from my memory what I was taught as a student. That's what they need. It doesn't exist in this country now, but that's where this enormous gap is developing from excellence to people who can't make the, with the journey onto the first steps of the ladder. That's what we have to concentrate on. We have to take the training to the country. Thank you. Thank you.